In my series with gin from Cambridge Distillery, I have come to the mighty, the luxurious, the decadent truffle gin. The first truffle gin in the world that not only will satisfy all you truffle lovers out there, but also excite you guys who want to serve a luxurious host dinner gin to your guests, a so-called DJ Steve. Let's take a closer look at this unique gin. Hi guys, and welcome to High on Gin. Today I will take a closer look at the decadent gin extravaganza, the Cambridge Distillery Truffle Gin, made with the best and most expensive truffles in the world, the white truffles from Alba in Piemonte. And as it is with everything master distiller William Loeb does, nothing is left to circumstances, but has a well, you can say greater meaning and purpose. So, when he created the world's first truffle gin, it was never the purpose just, just to do a gin with truffles. No, it simply just turned out that uh, truffles were the best ingredient in his hunt for perfection when he wanted to create this new type of gin, this DJ Steve gin. But before we talk to William about why he made this gin, and before we let him uh, take us through the taste of the gin, let's take a closer look at the truffle itself and some of the historic things that led up to its enormous popularity. The term truffle has a Latin origin, terra tuber, which means outgrow from the earth. And the first testimony of truffles being used comes from uh, Europe and can be found in the Naturalis Historia from around 70 AD by Pliny the Elder. And these writings are by uh, many considered the first written encyclopedia. And the Greek, they also used truffles in the kitchen as demonstrated by the philosopher Plutarch of Chaeronea, uh, who stated, in the first uh, century AD, that the rare and precious fungus was born from a combination of natural elements such as water, heat, and lightning. And this theory inspired the poet Juvenal. And according to him, truffles originated from a lightning that hit the earth near an oak tree. A lightning that was made by the father of the gods, Jupiter, as the Roman calls him, or Zeus, as the Greek called him. In addition to this legend, since Jupiter, or Zeus, was known for his tremendous sexual activity, truffles were considered highly aphrodisiac. Well, through the various centuries, the use of truffles have been, well, in and out of the history books. There were times when truffles were outlawed by the church by calling it the fruit of the devil due to its intense aroma and flavors, and maybe because of its reputation of being an aphrodisiac. In the Renaissance that took place between the 14th century and the 17th century, the truffles were found at the most prestigious banquets uh, for the royalties all over Europe, calling it garlic uh, of the riches. And at the end of the Renaissance, in the 17th century, the white truffle of Piemonte uh, had become the most valuable truffles by all the uh, courts of Europe. In fact, truffle hunting in Piemonte was considered a palace entertainment to which guests and foreign ambassadors were invited. And jumping forward to the 20th century, when Giacomo Mora left his modest family farm in 1909 to set up a small shop called um, uh, Tatufi Mora in the village of Alba, where he sold local products, including the local white truffle. And in uh, 1929, he decided to create an entire event around the truffles with the creation of the first truffle fair of Alba. And by the mid 1930s, the, uh, the event was even inspiring international headlines, and Mora looked to pursue a broader potential for his precious produce. But of course, World War II had other plans. 
Despite the growth of its domestic stature, the festival would not enjoy a significant foreign audience until the late 1940s. And even before uh, modern ideas of marketing, uh, Giacomo Mora looked at his beloved produce from a long-term perspective and knew that a way to create even more, shall we call it, hype around the white truffle was through the use of celebrities. In 1951, they found a monstrous white truffle weighing 2.25 kilos. And Giacomo Mora did something very, very clever. He sent it to the American president, Harry Truman, as a gift. An ingenious marketing stunt. Truman, for his part, was so euphoric, euphoric uh, by the offering and the taste that he requested the White House to sign a five-year contract with Mora, guaranteeing a consistent in-season supply. And throughout the decade, Mora sent the white truffles to uh, several uh, celebrities like Winston Churchill, Rita Hayworth, Marilyn Monroe and Joe DiMaggio, and Alfred Hitchcock even accepted a personal invitation to the region in 1959. The mystery of the taf uh, Tatufo seducted him into drafting a screenplay, naturally about a murder of a local truffle hunter. Well, although the script was never, uh, was never produced, he returned to Hollywood and shared his newfound culinary curiosity with prominent tastemakers of the time. With the enormous interest and the many new fans that the white truffles have gotten uh, ever since, the price of a white truffle is now at its highest. The price uh, for one pound or about 450 grams is getting close to $6,000. And if you look back in 2019, it was on only around eleven to $1,200. So expensive stuff with a lot of uh, glamorous history or stories around it. But let's get back to the gin here. Why would someone even consider using some of the most expensive ingredient in a gin? Is it because luxury sells or to create a marketing gimmick? Well, knowing William, this would never ever be the case. No, there is a much more interesting reason. A search for creating the perfect DJ Steve by deciphering what makes a good post-dinner drink and then trying to fulfill these requirements, but from a gin perspective. And of course, William didn't take the easy way of just using maceration and a barrel to add some of the known DJ Steve characteristics, but he had to take the hard way of doing it just right through distillation. Here is what William said when I asked him why a truffle gin. So a question that I'm often asked about our truffle gin is why? And that is a valid question. Uh, and actually, it's a relatively simple answer. Um, I made the observation that gin, because of its sort of citrus character in particular, gin is an ideal aperitif. It's what makes gin so uh, zesty, vibrant, mouth-watering. It is a perfect pre-dinner drink. And yet, sometimes I want to drink gin after dinner. And it was whilst I was looking for a, a DJ Steve, uh, specifically I was in a, a two Michelin star restaurant and the DJ Steve trolley arrived and I asked if there was any gin on that DJ Steve trolley and the sommelier quite literally laughed at me and said, no, sir, uh, there's no gin good enough for this trolley, which I thought was rather rude, actually, uh, but then came to realize he wasn't being rude. He was using the word good enough, not as a statement of, uh, of quality, but in fitness for purpose. So. For example, this is a very good pen. I use it every day, uh, but it is a terrible bottle opener. It is not good enough to be a bottle opener. It was not created to be a bottle opener. And so I realized that when um, people were conceiving of something being good enough to be a DGSD, what they were actually referring to was the properties rather than the quality level of the liquid. Now, what are the properties of a great DGSD? Well, they are quite literally the opposite to an apparent Whereas an aperitif should be mouth cleansing, with a digestive after dinner, you need something with rich, robust, complex, and long flavors. Those which can stand up to all of the flavors that have gone before, possibly even coffees beforehand, uh, all the way through a meal. So you need a really different flavor profile. So which spirits are good enough to be digestives? Well, 
you can probably guess that the trolley that was presented before me was populated almost exclusively with whiskies, cognacs, armagnacs, most of which were my age or older. Which is to say that through oak maturation, they had achieved a level of concentration and complexity that made them ideal for digestive serving. Now, I thought there must be a way to create this character in a gin. And the obvious way would be to take 235 litres of gin, put them inside a 235 litre barrel and wait for 20 years. But I think we both know each other well enough by now, Hans Henrik, to understand that that would not be my approach. So instead, I decided to set myself this challenge of creating this flavour profile through distillation instead of maturation. And I did that by taking a very literal approach of looking at what are the flavour profiles of these more mature spirits. And inevitably, if you look at generic maturation notes, you're going to find these oxidative notes that come through uh, of things like uh, leather and tar and smoke and chocolate and forest floor. Uh, and so I thought I could find a parallel and simply distill these items, thereby capturing that character and bring that into a gym. Now, that was fraught with, uh, with operational and pragmatic issues. I won't go into all of them now, but we can perhaps do a longer episode on that another time. Uh, but to shortcut it, uh, I found that within this sort of forest floor spectrum, the idea of using truffle would give me a pathway into that beautiful earthy level of complexity while still retaining the freshness that I needed to keep the gin a gin. Now, that did present even more problems, I'm afraid, because truffles are packed full of volatiles. And that is to say that truffles actually smell more than they taste. And you know this because, you know, if you go to a restaurant serving truffles, you can smell them when you walk in the door. But truffles are always served on relatively neutral foods, sort of creamy pastas, mushroom risottos and the like. Now, it is a cruel twist of fate that the opposite is true of juniper, which tastes more than it smells. Now. What that meant was that I had to find a midway. The truffle gin is a gin, so it must taste predominantly of juniper, otherwise it is not gin. Uh, but you have to be able to taste the truffle, otherwise it's not a truffle gin. So I had to create something whereby the aroma was predominantly truffle, but the palate was predominantly juniper. And in doing so, and by understanding the interplay of your sense of smell and taste, which is to say ortho and retro nasal olfaction, I was able to create the complexity and concentration required to make the world's first, and I would argue best, digestif gin. Just like I did with the Japanese gin, I asked William to take us through the taste experience of the truffle gin. And if you have the truffle gin, again, stop the video and pour yourself a glass and enjoy the tasting with William. And if you haven't got the gin yet, this, this, my friends, is what awaits you out there. So this is how William describes the taste experience. So when I serve a truffle gin, usually I literally serve it like this. I deal with truffle gin in the same way that you might the finest malts or cognacs that you could get your hands on. Uh, so I will usually be drinking it either neat or perhaps just with a single ice cube. It does make a great Negroni, but that's a story for a different time. Whilst we're convinced that, uh, whilst we're uh, concentrating rather on just tasting it, it's important that we keep this in a clean glass. So as always, I'll draw people's attention to the appearance here. Crystal clear, not chill filtered, just distilled properly the first time. And then we're going to come to the nose. Now the nose on uh, truffle gin is really interesting. Any chefs watching this will immediately, within five or six inches of the glass, recognize not only truffle but they will recognize the lengths that i've gone to because this isn't just any old truffle i've used white truffle from alba in piemonte gram for gram this costs more than gold it's one of the most expensive foodstuffs in the world uh, but it tastes much better than gold so when you get this in your glass you'll understand why i made that choice now you really don't have to get very close to your nose at all just breathing normally uh, with this sort of distance in front of the glass you'll be able to get that beautiful, rich, earthy, rancio, developed forest floor nature that is truffle. And probably even the most gin-obsessed of the people watching this 
will struggle from this distance to be able to pick up the juniper at all. That's very much the nature of the juniper tasting more than it smells. On the nose, it's recessive to that incredibly volatile element of the truffle. So when we bring this to the palate, it's one of the most interesting taste experiences the world of gin can offer you. Because when it hits your palate, you're going to notice this gin, uh, sorry, this juniper and truffle position will invert. And as soon as this hits your palate, all of the flavors and aromas that sit underneath the truffle on the nose will come to the fore. This is my equivalent of an optical illusion for your mouth, an olfactory illusion, if you will. Let's taste it together. And it's that burst of freshness and then that racy, linear note that comes through the pineness of the juniper. And it comes as such a surprise when it hits the palate because the truffle was so dominant and yet it comes in at the finish once it's on the palate. And the really fun thing to do here, it's always easier for me because usually I'm talking as I finish this tasting, but if you're breathing with your mouth open, as you breathe in, you'll get the truffle and as you breathe out, you get the juniper again and that flip-flop between the juniper-driven character and the truffle-driven character builds in this amazing complexity. Now, there are botanicals in here other than truffle and juniper, but it took me a very, very long time to precisely nail these down. And you may be aware of what happened when I told the world how I made my Japanese gin. Uh, and so I decided on this occasion to keep the rest of the recipe a secret. So the recipe to truffle gin is known only to myself and to our production manager. And that's why the two of us never travel alone, uh, sorry, never travel together in the same private jet. Yeah, is that and the fact that we don't have a private jet, but you take my point. Uh, so we keep this recipe very, very secret, but all of that beautiful complexity that rushes out onto the palate that was completely unknown, makes this so surprising, so rewarding. And it's my research and understanding of the nature of author and retro nasal olfaction and the role that they play in creating flavor that has helped me to include the final critical ingredient in, tr in this truffle gin. And that final, arguably most important ingredient is not in here, it's you. Cheers to that. I really, really agree with William. This gin is unlike any other gin. This optical illusion, as he called it, is such a cool and different experience. And the world's first DJ Steve gin is the ultimate gin, I think, for occasions like New Year's Eve post-dinner drink. Just imagine serving this rich, decadent gin to your guests. What could be better? So, this was the third episode in my little series of tasting some of the gins from Cambridge Distillery. I have now tasted the Cambridge Dry Gin, and if you haven't seen that episode, I will link to it up here. And then I tested the Japanese gin, the world's uh, first gin entirely with Japanese botanicals. And again, if you haven't seen that episode, I will link to it up here. Uh, and now we've gone through the truffle gin. There are still several gins from the distillery that I could test. And if you saw my latest uh, review when I tested this, the Japanese gin, you also saw that I'm now starting up a little saving, saving up some money for the world's most expensive gin, the Cambridge Distillery Vatenshi Gin. Well, if I'll ever get to that point where I have the 2,500 pounds that it requires, I don't know, but I would love to get it and taste it. And here's another thing that I would love to do and that I will do. And that is to go and visit the distillery. And you can actually go there as well and see the distillery. And you can visit the new Cambridge uh, Gin Laboratory, where you can get an amazing experience, whether you want to taste it, mix it, or make it yourself. And I'll let William explain what awaits us. So come and visit us. You must. Uh, it's really easy. I guess most of your audience uh, are over there in Denmark. Uh, it's really easy to get to us from London and it's very easy to get to London. We're just a 50 minute train journey from London out to Cambridge. And then once you're here, you have two choices. You can come and visit me right here in Cambridge Distillery. It's about a 15 minute taxi ride from the train station. 
or you can walk straight into the center of Cambridge in its historic city center and sandwich between two of the most famous colleges in the world on a beautiful cobble street, you can come and visit Cambridge Gin Laboratory. Now the Gin Lab, as we call it, is our retail and education center. It's open seven days a week and every day of the week you can come in and join us on one of our tasting classes to find out more about how and why we do what we do. And you can even have a go at doing it yourself. Alexandre Dumas said it so fine. Truffles can, on certain occasions, make women more tender and men more lovable. And I can only say that Cambridge Truffle Gin does, does both to men and to women every time you enjoy it. Until next time.